Cavalcade of America, starring Ida Lupino. Tonight, the DuPont Company brings you Abigail Opens the White House, starring Ida Lupino on the Cavalcade of America. Now, here is Game Whitman. Good evening. The DuPont Company has received many letters from pest control operators and compounders of rat poisons who are finding Antu a most effective, powerful poison for eliminating the common brown rat. Rats readily eat bait containing Antu because they cannot detect it. Antu rat poisons come in ready-to-use baits or dust powders. While Antu is not as dangerous as most rat poisons, it is a poison. Therefore, pets and animals, and of course, children, should be kept away from it. Antu is now available at your dealers in many leading brands of rat poison. Antu is one of the DuPont products which contribute to better things for better living through chemistry. And now, Abigail opens the White House. Starring Ida Lupino as Abigail Adams on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. It is the year 1797. The temporary capital of the youthful United States is Philadelphia. And in the home of the president, John Adams... Very well, Mr. President. If you feel that way about it... Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Hamilton. Good afternoon, Mrs. Adams. Uh, Just a moment, please. Yes? I... uh, Mr. Hamilton, is there anything wrong? Wrong? Why do you ask? Well, when Alexander Hamilton slams a door and roars at the president... Oh, I'm sorry. Forgetting my manners is unpardonable. But I didn't know you were out here. Is there something wrong, Mr. Hamilton? Mrs. Adams, if you have any influence at all with your husband, you'll talk with him. Politics, sir? No, national honor. Ours. He insists upon a conciliatory attitude toward France. And you? I say have war with the French. If they want it, we'll give it to them. Mrs. Adams, if your husband continues his present policy, he won't be known as the second president of the United States, but as the man who disgraced his country by a shameful knuckling under... I don't believe that, sir. No? Suppose you ask him then, Mrs. Adams. Good day. John... May I come in? Of course, dear. John, I, I just spoke to Mr. Hamilton. Why does he want war with France? Oh, Abigail, dear, don't bother your head about that. It's my concern. And mine. No, please. Mine and the concern of everyone in our country. John, why is there talk of another war? My dear, France is angry. Washington refused to help them in their war against England. They haven't forgotten. But we couldn't. It was too soon after the war for independence. I know, but nations aren't apt to consider conditions, only actions. And Alexander Hamilton... Wants war. A war to him would be a chance for power. First France, then Spain, march into Mexico. And you? I want to talk peace with France. I want to send envoys to reach an agreement. Hamilton and my own Federalist Party are against... But a war now would ruin us and France. I wish you could make Hamilton see that. John, you must do what you think right. Right? Right. How am I to know, Abby? Suppose you send the envoys. If they refuse permission to speak to the French directory, it would mean that France considers us too weak and significant to parley with. If I don't send them, France will take our silence as meaning we want war. Either way, Abby, I'm bound to do the wrong thing. John, listen to me. You must do what your conscience says is right. Yes, again, that word, right. Will the people think I'm right? They never like me. Perhaps someone more popular... Oh, no, don't talk like that. Even General Washington refused a third term because of... Well, because of attacks on his policies and character. This is not a matter of personality, my dear, or personal vanity. You must realize we are facing a war with France. Then send the envoys, John. Send them. If we were strong enough to win a war with England, well, we're strong enough to talk peace with France. Anything that will preserve peace for us will preserve our country. It will mean an open break with Hamilton and the party. But it may mean peace when we need it most. You should be president, Abby. All right. I'll send on boys. And expect the worst. (laughs) 
Good afternoon, Mrs. Adams. The president's in? Why, yes, Mr. Hamilton. May I see him? Of course. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hamilton is here, John. May I see you, sir? Of course, Mr. Hamilton. Abby, will you excuse us? Certainly, my dear. By your leave, Mrs. Adams. Mr. President, this is the worst disgrace any nation has ever had to face. Mrs. Adams, I must talk to you about this house. I was in the kitchen. Mrs. Adams, do you hear me? What? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Briesler. What did you say? Well, why are you looking so, Mrs. Adams? Are you worried? Worried? Oh, no, of course not. No, everything will be all right. Well, I hope so. There's talk of war in the streets and in the markets. That's enough of that in this house, Mrs. Briesler. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, you run along and get some tea. Perhaps Mr. Hamilton will stay. Hmm. And a fine place this house is to entertain. When are we going to that fine new mansion in Washington? Oh, heaven only knows. Huh? I doubt there is such a place. Well, whatever it is, it'll be better than this. Oh, uh, Mr. Hamilton, will you have some tea? It's very kind of you, Mrs. Adams, but I'm afraid I have no time. The president has given us very little time. Good day. Mrs. Briesler, make some tea anyway. The president may want some. Yes, ma'am, Mrs. Adams. Well, Abby? Yes, my dear. I shouldn't have sent those envoys. Oh, there's news then? Yes, there's news. News that's made Hamilton and the others grin behind their sleeves. Oh, they'll have something to crow about now. They'll have something fine to put before the people. They'll make me out a great idiot who bowed to the French and scraped... I won't hear that talk, John. I won't, you hear. You'll have to, Abby. That's, that's what they're saying now. But why? Because the French refused to see our envoys unless... Unless we paid a tribute, a bribe, Abby. A bribe so that we could talk to the French directory. Oh, no, John. No, they couldn't do that. But they have. Now I have no recourse but to make a full report to Congress and the public. And if you do, it will mean war. There's no alternative. Try again, John. Once more, please try again. Are you mad, Abby? No, I'll not risk having our national honor muddied again. I'll not even give the French agents the dignity of naming them. I'll return an insult by giving them to history simply as X, Y, and Z. Well, here we are, Harry. This is our box. Now, John, try to enjoy the play. Forget your worries for tonight, please. Uh, I shouldn't have come, Abby. Here's your chair, dear. Thank you, my dear. The theater's crowded. Yes, it is. An audience staring up at us, laughing at me for the French fiasco. But I had to make it public. <laughs> yeah, the play's starting already. Who's that on the stage, Abby? Why, I, I believe it's Gilbert Fox, the actor. If you please, ladies and gentlemen. If you please. One moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the great honor tonight of having with us in yonder box Mr. John Adams, President of the United States. Oh. Abby gave her. They're cheering me. Stand up, John. Stand up. Oh, but I... Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, in the President's honor... And to show him that we will follow where he leads, we present a new song, sung to the tune of the President's March, accompanied by the band. <laughs>
John. Oh, yes, Abby, dear. I'll be through in a moment. I didn't mean to disturb you, my dear. But I wanted to talk with you. I can't sleep. Well, no wonder. The excitement tonight, the play, the people at the theater, that song. Oh, Abby, I was afraid they'd hate me, laugh at me. And the applause, the cheers. You liked them, didn't you? Of course I liked them. I'm human. So are they, my dear. Yes. Well, now, please, dear, there's so much to be done. There always is when there's a war coming. Abby, darling, what's done is done. I did my best. You know what happened. But there mustn't be any war. There mustn't. It's out of our hands. Oh, no, it's not out of your hands. You're the president. Listen to me, Abby. You heard the people tonight. They're not afraid of war. They want it. Yes, yes, they want it. Like children reaching out to touch a fire. It looks so beautiful and heroic. No one ever looks ahead to the hurt and agony. Oh, Abby, you're overwrought. Please go to bed and try to sleep. I can't, John. Neither can you. I will when I finish. No, you won't, and you know it. What do you mean? Oh, you're too honest, too good, too true to yourself in the country to let this thing happen. I tell you, they want it. I, I can't stop it now. France had her chance. And you to... still have your chance. Abby, I'll hear no more. Go to bed. Please. John, listen to me. I, I can't believe you share your party's eagerness for this war. And why not? From a man who thought he brought dishonor and disgrace to his country, I find him a man who's popular for the first time, Abby. Why... Why, they've rallied to me. The Federalists support me to a man. I'm acclaimed a hero. And for those little things... You... Little things? How can you call them that? How can you realize what it means to a man to be president and know that the people in his party think him a fool and then suddenly to realize they've that they... They've gone blind with war hysteria. The bands, the shouting, the cheering. Those are little things. Too little for you, John. Oh, Abby. Abby, why did you come in here? My darling, think. Think. Not of those little things, but of the years ahead. Think what war means. I have thought, Abby. You've never been more miserable in your life. You're right. Right, as usual. John, isn't, isn't the future of our republic worth one more attempt at peace? But even if it is, my dear, Hamilton and the party will never allow it. They've made all plans for war. Washington called out of retirement to lead the troops. Fighting at sea. But no declaration yet. John, you're president. The people chose you, not Alexander Hamilton. Yes. Yes, of course. I can send my own envoy without consulting anyone to ask for a fair and honorable peace. Will you do it, John? I'm glad you came in here, Abby. I feel as though a great load has been lifted from my heart. Abigail. Abigail, where are you? Right here, dear. Oh, Abby, I've wonderful news. From France. Your envoy. No, nothing yet from France. This news is for you. We're moving at last to Washington. The mansion? It's finished. After 12 years, yes. Oh, John. John, it's wonderful. <laughs> We'll be lost in 30 rooms, Abby. Oh, 30 rooms. Oh, now we can give parties, receive foreign ambassadors, envoys. Why, we'll be able to use all our wonderful linens and silverware. And the piano, John. We'll set it up. Oh, dear, I, I must tell Mrs. Breesler. Mrs. Breesler! Mrs. Breesler! Oh, what's the meeting Mrs. Evans? What's wrong? Well, you can stop your eternal sniffing at this house now. We're going to Washington. Glory! To Washington? The mansion? Finished. Thirty rooms with great shining windows, smooth walls and polished floors. Oh. We'll be able to use all the furniture we've had stored away for so long and the crimson velvet chairs. Oh, we'll make it look like a mansion fit for the second president of the United States and all the rest to come after. You are listening to Ida Lupino as Abigail Adams and John McIntyre as President Adams in Abigail Opens the White House on the Cavalcade of America. Sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living. 
sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As the second part of our story opens, Abigail Adams becomes the first wife of a president to occupy the presidential mansion in Washington. With her hopes high and her enthusiasm for the new mansion overcoming for the moment the fear of war with France, Abigail enters. Oh. Oh, but Mrs. Breesler, it's not finished. Look, the walls aren't even plastered and the windows... Some of them don't have glass in them. Mansion. Hmm. It's no better than a big barn. And a cold one at that. Thirty rooms. And not six of them fit to live in. Look, they're dark and... Hey, dis- the men are here with your things. Oh, who are you? I'm the carpenter, madam. Well, what have the workmen been doing all these weeks? We've been waiting for material, ma'am. And there's no wood in the fireplaces. And nobody to chop or cut it, ma'am. But what can you expect with us practically at war with France? We aren't at war. At least not yet. If you're the carpenter, why don't you fix the roof? Well, I've been trying to get at that, ma'am, but there ain't been a chance to... Well, you could at least have gotten someone to clean. It's filthy. You can't expect the president and his wife to live here. You can't help it, ma'am. It's the best we could do. Right. Keep it in here. Oh! Be careful with that. Be careful. It's my piano. And you've scratched the floors quite enough. All right. All right. This is a lot of it. The lot? Not just a moment. One, two, three. Three barrels. Where are the rest? Uh, the rest, ma'am? Uh, you see any more, Jeremy? That's all we had, ma'am. Oh, no. No, my china, my silverware. They're not here. They yeah, probably got lost or stolen. Oh. That's all we saw, ma'am. Oh, all your lovely silver and china. Oh, there, there now, Mrs. Breesler. Stop your crying. Oh, I'm going straight to the president and tell him. Oh, no, you're not. He's not to know this. Do you understand? But your silver, the china. Mr. Adams is not to be bothered. Abby, Abby, where are you? Oh, this barn of a place. And now we're robbed. Stop it, do you hear? I- I'm in here, John. The big room in the front. Oh. You go down to the kitchen and make yourself some tea. Go on now. Yes, but it's terrible. That's what it is. It's terrible. Abby, this is an outrage, this place. Oh, nonsense, John. It's... It's new, that's all. New? It's unfinished, it's so new. Well, once we get servants from Philadelphia... Servants? Well, there are none to be had. And I'll not have you doing all this work. Well, look, John. Here's our piano. Uh, Doesn't it make you feel right at home? Are these all the boxes and barrels we brought? I'm sure there were more. I'm sure. Listen, dear. You remember this? But, Abby, there's something wrong here. Your clothes trunk, where's that? Always liked this song. Remember. Abigail... I don't see how you can play in the middle of this cold, stark emptiness. It's an outrage. It's asking too much of any woman. Remember what Solomon said, my dear. A cheerful countenance and a merry heart do good like medicine. Now come along. Sit down and listen. What are you doing? Scrubbing the floor. I... Mrs. Otis is waiting to see you. Who? Mrs. Otis of Georgetown. Oh, dear. Oh, help me out quickly, oh, dear. Oh, where is she? I told her to wait in the oval room. Good I... afternoon. Oh, dear. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Otis. I, uh, I thought I'd drop in and take tea with you. But I guess I'd better go. Oh, no, no. Please stay. You seem to be engaged. Excuse me, Mrs. Otis. Mrs. Breesler, prepare tea, will you? Yes, ma'am. I'm getting The servants are gone, Mrs. Allen? Oh, they were never here, Mrs. Otis. There were none to be had. Oh. Do, do you do all the work here, Mrs. Adams? Well, Mrs. Breesler helps, but she can't do it all alone. But surely the wife of our president shouldn't be scrubbing floors. You were scrubbing, weren't you? Uh, very well, too, don't you think? Huh. I suppose so. I wouldn't know. Shall we go into the next room? Oh, no, really, Mrs. Adams. I think I'd better go. I'm sure you have so much to do. Uh, Yes, I have quite a lot to do. When I finish scrubbing, I have to wash the windows. (laughs) What few there are. I see. Well, I have other calls to make. Of course. I hope you won't find the other ladies 
quite so busy. I'm sure I won't, Mrs. Adams. Good day. Good day, Mrs. Otis. I'm afraid, Abby, dear, that wasn't quite diplomatic. Oh, Oh, John, you heard. I heard, but there's something more important now. The French minister, he's here, here in the mansion. The French minister? Oh, when did he come? Not two minutes ago. I had to tell you, and I've got to get back to him. I can't keep him waiting. Well, does that mean your, your envoy was... Well, I don't know, but just the fact that, that he called here is good. I had to tell you, dear, you first. Oh, John. John, if there were only some way we could entertain uh, a banquet. The French place a great deal of importance on elegance and pomp. Yes, but not here. A banquet. Oh, why not? What? Oh, nothing. Nothing now. Get off with you. And John. Yes, my dear. Uh, walk slowly. Very slowly. Don't let him see you've been hurrying. Yes, dear. Oh, bless you. Uh, Mrs. Breesler. Mrs. Breesler. Yes. Yes, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Breesler. Tonight, we're going to have a banquet. Yes, ma'am. A banquet? Uh, where? Where? Here. What? Uh, close your mouth, Mrs. Breesler. But we can't. It's impossible. No servants, no silver, no decent china. Oh, it'll be a disgrace. Go to Mrs. Otis. Mrs. Otis? Yes. Uh, take her silverware, her china, and her servants. Tell her the government is commandeering them for this evening. And if she objects, tell her it'll be her one and only chance to meet the French minister. I think you'll get what we need. <laughs> That you? Yes, Abby. I've been waiting for you. Come, sit here at the piano with me. Anything wrong, dear? Just this. What is it? The latest outrage. Oh. Yes, Hamilton has published this letter about me, calling me a traitor. Look at the title. Concerning the public conduct and character of John Adams, Esquire. But why, John? Why should he do that? <laughs> Because it seems that our banquet for the French minister and my actions have deprived the party and Hamilton of their war. Well, what do you care what they say? You prevented war at a time our country needed peace desperately. Do you know what this letter means? Do you know what this attack will do? Yes, I do. You won't be re-elected, is that it? That's it, Abby. Well, then let it be that way. You and I, will we'll go back to Massachusetts, to Quincy. But, Abby, everything I tried to do for my country will be swept away. All my principles forgotten. Oh, no, my dear. No, you've left the country a legacy of peace. That will well, never be forgotten. It was forgotten two months after the peace treaty was signed. Only because people are still too close to it to realize the true value of your action. I hope you're right, Abby. I know it. Oh, listen, John. I'll go back to Quincy before you. And I'll get the house ready. Then we can take up our... Well, our private lives again. Private? <laughs> Abby, either Jefferson or Burr will win the election. And no matter which, I'll wager our son John Quincy will be humiliated. He'll be recalled as minister to Prussia. But I won't let them damage the name of Adams anymore, Abby. I'll recall him myself. Yes, John. <laughs> will people remember me as the fool who dishonored his country? Or the president who saved it from war. Remember this, my dear. Hail Columbia, happy land. Yes. My one brief moment of popularity. Oh, John. Knowing what is right for your country and doing it, no matter what the cost, is a far better thing than a few moments of cheering and popularity. But people forget and only remember the bad. No. No, it took strength and courage to do what you did. And someday America will know it. Thank you, my darling, for this moment. Thank you for all the happy moments in here. You made this a home, Abby. Not a mansion for show and pomp, but a home. I'm sorry you have to leave it, Abby. Well, it doesn't belong to us, John belongs to America now. It will still be a home, my dear. A home for those who will follow us. And may God give them all the wisdom and courage to do what is right. Always. And 
Abigail Adams left the presidential mansion, and immaculate and beautiful as the White House is today, it has never been more lovingly and tenderly cared for than when she was its housekeeper. Only in America could the wife of the highest governing officer be a housekeeper. Only here could a housekeeper give advice to the highest governing officer. For it is in America that the will of the common people is supreme. The wisdom of cobblers and butchers and foundrymen and housekeepers is as great as their numbers. It is in America that great men know the value of little people and that little people become great men and women. Here is Gain Whitman speaking for DuPont. Most common metals are attacked by corrosion. Did you ever notice a railroad track when the trains haven't been running for a couple of days? The gleaming steel becomes red with rust. All of us know rust. But there are other kinds of corrosion attacking other metals beside iron and steel. Corrosion is worse in some climates than in others. It's pretty bad where the weather is hot and humid, for instance, or near the ocean where the air is very moist. But corrosion goes on everywhere and all the time, day and night. Wherever you use metal, you must fight it. One of the best ways to combat it is to give it a prime coat of paint. You've seen a steel bridge with blotches of red or orange paint on it, looking as if it had the measles. That's primer paint, put on to retard corrosion. In the future, you'll be seeing yellow as well as red and orange. For DuPont zinc chromate, which is bright yellow in color, has been added to the list of primer pigments by chemical science. DuPont zinc chromate helps form a corrosion-resisting paint film. It neutralizes the acids formed when a coat of ordinary paint breaks down and brings about the formation of an invisible protective film on the metal, which greatly decreases the natural tendency of steel to rust. The standard tests for primer paint along with standard tests for just about everything else manufactured in the United States, from petroleum products to welding rods, are those of the American Society for Testing Materials. We take this means of congratulating the men and women of the ASTM on their new headquarters in Philadelphia. And we wish them all success in their continuing effort to see to it that the most reliable products made anywhere are those of American manufacturers. Products among which we are proud to include our own DuPont Better Things for Better Living through Chemistry. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade brings you Robert Young in Mr. Pullman's Palace Car, the dramatic story of George Mortimer Pullman who changed train travel from a trying experience to a pleasurable pastime. Be sure and listen next Monday to Mr. Pullman's Palace Car, the story of the first sleeping coach starring Robert Young on the Cavalcade of America. Music for the DuPont Cavalcade is composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Tonight's Cavalcade was written by Priscilla Kent. Ida Lupino may currently be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, The Man I Love. Featured in the cast with Miss Lupino was John McIntyre as President Adams. This is John Heaston inviting you to listen next week to Robert Young in Mr. Pullman's Palace Car... On the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> Cavalcade of America came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcast.